All right, so some history for Zip's Law. So this is pre-Zip. Zip was not, uh, Zip was uh, about to start cutting books up soon after this. So uh, thinking about stenography, right? So there's some good motivations for this. So um, shorthand, uh, and you think about Morse code and so on. Like how, what's it? And we'll talk a little bit about it. We'll talk about entropy when we get to Mandelbrot. But how do you encode something well? And is language well encoded, right? Do we use long words, short words in the right kind of balance? Uh, uh, yeah, so stenography was this, you know, elaborated in all sorts of ways, but you want to quickly capture what someone is saying, lots of good words, brachygraphy or tachygraphy. Uh, and looking at that, you see these uh, word frequencies. That, that was a way of getting out word frequencies. And I don't think I have it here, but Scrabble, for example, right? So the character invented Scrabble. I don't know if he made a lot of money, but he, I think he lived in Queens or Brooklyn, got out the New York Times and looked at the front page and counted up all the letters. And that was his estimate for the distribution of the 100 letters in, it's 198 plus two blanks, I think. The distribution of letters in Scrabble, right? There's only one Z, Z, and a bunch of E's, I don't know, Scrabble players. Uh, but it's, it's somewhat adjacent, it's, you know, it's reasonably close to a version of uh, English, at least at one time. But then, of course, you know, someone says, what about C or you know, Greek letters and and then someone wants za, pizza, right? That's really, right. People fight about what should be allowed in Scrabble or not. All right, but the same kind of thing, right? So you want to, you know, what, what's the real distribution? So they, these are people just looking at, this is for city sizes. Um, so it's a German um, publication. And this is often, this is often the case, something that becomes a big story at some point in science. It turns out, of course, many people have been thinking about it in different ways. And, and you know, over time, we, we can collect this sort of set of uh, prior works that, that that kind of point in that direction. Uh, this one has been, Yule's work has been known for a long time. So Yule's a pretty famous character. Uh, so this, is, this has been, these ones are sort of you know, popped up more recently in, in terms of people pointing to them. So this is just a, the number of species per genus, right? So we've got this biological thing. This is pre-DNA and pre all the good stuff that we can do with um, you know, finding trees of evolution and so on. So this is, you know, as, uh, you know, as people have decided, right? This is, I've got a genus, I've got a platypus, I'm gonna make some stuff up, yeah. So, <clears throat> anyway, that's okay, but they, it turned out that there were, you know, there were a lot of, um, there's you know, one species in, in, in a genus, there's many of those, just as we have these words that appear once in a book kind of situation, and then there are some, uh, there's a genus, you know, which have a bazillion species, right, that they're really tight. So there's an evolutionary story behind that, and you have to think about, you know, do these mechanisms have anything to do with each other? Uh, so Locker, I mentioned before, this is a number of scientific um, papers per author. So this is, again, this is the 20s. There are a couple of these kinds of things for um, bibliometrics, if you like, uh, library laws. Uh, there's a, there are some recent observations. So this is kind of, a, so there's a famous idea, right, that, especially in, say, pure math, but that, that everything's done by your 27, you know, and usually you have a duel at that point and get killed or something. This is things have happened to people in the 1700s. But it turns out if you look at many, many people now, we have all this data, uh, if you look, and, and you have to think about people having different career spans and so on, but it, it seems that the most cited paper that people have occurs randomly in their career. At, at, there's no, it's not at the end or the front, or you know, the front is sort of what we thought, um, but it appears to be random. So that's nice, that's, that's not bad. That's a good thing to have. So you don't have to give up and go and work at the Mint like Newton did. He made a lot of money. Okay, so Zip, as we've talked about, Zip's book. So Zip comes along and kind of puts a whole bunch of stuff together. And that's pretty inspirational for people to then really start thinking about what's the mechanism behind this, right? It's a, it's a big enough book that, you know, it had enough impact at the time. Uh, this is Mandelbrot, um, character Mandelbrot, uh, who passed away a few years ago. Um, it's, been, you know, it's been sort of sad. I mean, there, you know, I've taught this course since 2006, and then I have to sort of transfer to talking about some of these people in the past. Uh, so uh, Mandelbrot um, came up, as I said, with an optimality argument. So he's going to say, well, uh, you know, lots of evolution, people talking with each other, we're going to end up with an efficient language, which the spelling of English might not um, suggest. But, uh, you, you know, it's, it's sort of plausible, right? Lots of, it's a social construction, we're working on it all the time, 
making it simpler. You know, we we figure out lol is a good thing to say, so we say that in real. You know, right. Uh, it's always bubbling away, evolving away, and, and there's a lot of pushback and evolution. And we've seen some kind of really cool things, like the I think the uh, scaling of uh, you know regularization of verbs. And that's that's really seems strong. Okay, so optimality argument, and so it's going to be about communication. That the words you use have to be you know pretty efficient. You don't want to have um, you know all this trouble for the decoder. It's, you don't want it to take too long. You want that channel to be not too overflowing with, with uh, words. And so that's going to be about entropy. Right? If you just say one word over and over and over, that's very low entropy, but it's not going to work in terms of communication. And if you have basically random words coming out of you, that's going to be a high entropy thing, but it's not going to make any sense. So you know, it feels OK. Entropy isn't really a measure of complexity, though, so that's a problem. It maximizes on randomness. There isn't a really good measure of complexity, which is another thing I'll I have some slides on building on that. I want to say one thing about it, which is there isn't, you shouldn't have a case where you measure one thing about a system. So I'll come to that later. It's a trap we fall into. We like to say there's the effective temperature or whatever. It's ridiculous. OK, so Herbert Simon. So this is a couple of years. This is a chapter in a book on communication. This is a whole separate paper um, with, as I'll show you later, a terrible title. It's just not exciting. The introduction is OK. So. But this is built around, well, look, we've seen this, this, these skewed distributions appear for, you know, so the Gaussian is this amazing thing that's sort of been discovered very strongly over the last couple of hundred years and elaborated. But now we've got these skewed distributions to think about and why are they there? So city sizes, income was there in his paper, the, pub, the luck thing and species per genus, which is Yule. So he puts these five things together and says, well, these are really different, right? So if there's anything going on here, it has to be a pretty simple mechanism that could have, you know, some... You, know, you may have to modify it a little bit in, in detail, but there should be some kernel of a mechanism that we can get out. Or maybe not. Maybe it's all special and different. And anthropology is right. OK. So to solar price, I mentioned before. And this is also still back in the time, I think, where he would go off to libraries or force students to go off to libraries and count things. So they did a lot of, uh, he's, he's got, uh, it's called Big Science, Little Science, or the other way around, uh, which is a beautiful little book. Things like the half-life of journals. So you just go to a journal, and this is sort of what you, you, know, you really would do this. You could see all of the, pop, all the journals, so it was sort of just right in front of you, you know, edition one, edition two, all the years going back in time. And you could, you could some, with a lot of work, you could say, go through and enumerate all, you know, write down all the papers, and then see which papers cited which papers within that journal, right? You could start to document that and write it down. Lots of writing, this is not all before. Really, computers are taking off, maybe, because um, it was really done in the 60s. And then see you know, how, how far typically does a paper cite back into the history of, a, of its field and how that varies across fields. So he was able to show that you know, there's half-life that, that uh, was, was changing and compressing potentially for different, different fields. The speeding up of science, right? There's been this exponential growth of science, and you could see this contraction. Um, so you actually end up talking more about what just happened, right? There's more stuff going on, but the, the gap, going, the uh, distance going back in, in knowledge is, in some sense, is, in terms of time, is, is getting shorter and shorter. So lots of different things. But he was thinking about the number of citations people have, right? Just that. So again, a hard thing to document, but with the web and then with um, the web of science, which you guys use that? You probably use Google Scholar if you use any of these things. Web of Science is a Thomson Reuters product, which was the first thing to do this, right? You could look up a paper and then see which paper, which was amazing. You see which papers cited it. You know, if you want to do that in a library, that is like a game over situation, right? You've got your paper from 1942, and you want to see, find all the papers that cited it in the future. You've got a library, so that's rough, you know? So you, you, you lose your mind doing that, right? It would be a Borgesian experience. But, uh, but of course, now we, we should be able to do it. And we, we did early on with the web coming online. People started to put all this, you know, this data up. So we, we can do this is, this is His work has now been sort of repeated and um, done in fantastic ways for, for this incredibly rich data set that we have. It's pretty good. You know, people tend to cite 
papers pretty well, and there's a lot of effort to make sure that works, but you can see things like errors propagating, right? So someone cites a paper, they get an error in it. It's a very specific kind of error. And then the papers that cite that paper have just copied the citation. So you can also track things like total laziness and um, <laughs> basic, basic low-level corruption in science. You know. <laughs> anyway. Um, What's that optimality argument? Yeah, right. Least effort. <laughs> uh, the least least uh, publishable unit is uh, right. Another evidence of that. But that's something where you you're trying to adapt to a, me a measurement, which is how many papers do you publish this year? <laughs> Doesn't matter if they're any good at all. We just want a number in a box, and then we're going to compare all those boxes. You know. All right. Okay, so these are, this is a nice history, and I guess I'm going around. And then there's a huge thing, and we'll come back to this later on. There are two massive papers at the end of the, uh, I guess, second millennium. So 1998 is uh, uh, Watts and Strogatz. I worked with Duncan for a long time. Um, well, we'll talk about these characters later on. And uh, Laszlo Barabasi, who's one of the heads of the Network Science Institute at Northeastern, which is a great thing that started um, a few years ago, and a number of our students have ended up in their, their team. So... And Rekha Albert, who's at Penn State, I think, now. So this is great, the World Wide Web. I mean, that's what it was all called, right? It was the World Wide Web. Uh, and, uh, but networks at large. But they, were look, they had, for example, they had Notre Dame's uh, website. And right, yeah. that, that, you know, it was a reasonable. These, these, and, and what was going on here is this is this transition from students suffering through books to you know, having it just something you could just scrape off and, and and play around with. So it is a, it's a data revolution. It's a result of data revolution. And a big change when you go from here to here is it turns out random networks are not what the world is made out of, right? So the pure random networks, which have been a great body of study, you know, remain a lovely thing. We'll talk about them. Um, there are simply none of them. There are no pure random networks in the real world, basically. I don't think anyone's found them. There are Poisson degree distributions, zero. Okay. That's okay. It's just that that's what pops out of your head if you're not worrying about the real world. 